We have a great pleasure now to hear from Commissioner Kevin McAleenan who uh, is uh, not only heading CBP now, but has a tremendous amount of experience working on border issues uh, for all of this century, I guess, in one way or another. And, uh, and now has that great responsibility that you know that combines trade facilitation with the very important security matters uh, of related to the homeland uh, with all types of threats that could come across our border, and hopefully that we're going to stop long before it gets to the border. So he's been working and is working hard on all the things that are really important to you, um, and facing all those contradictory pressures that are quite evident in trying to facilitate trade and assure security at the same time. Um, but he's been a, a good partner for many of us for many years, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say today, and he'll make some remarks and then be open to a couple of Q's and A's afterwards. Kevin, great to have you with us. Thanks so much, Tony. I really appreciate the invite again this year. Uh, I think last year it was in the, the big room with the lights and cameras. I think it's great to be in a more intimate setting uh, with so many experts, friends, mentors, uh, continued partners in the government of Mexico, uh, all here uh, to have a, a, you know, really an export, uh, expert dialogue, exports are important too, an expert dialogue <laughs> on, on border issues. Uh, so, I, you know, I have a series of prepared remarks. I, I'm going to deviate heavily because I don't want to read at you at, at lunchtime, and I do want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, but there, there are a couple of highlights that, that I want to offer. Uh, you know, a year ago, I, I, as acting commissioner, I got to speak and I, I talked about how our dialogue uh, was a, as strong as ever with our operational partners. And, and I'm very happy to report that that's continued uh, in the last 12 months uh, very dramatically. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to travel now five times uh, to Mexico City in, in that time. I, I will note that, uh, Jose, your colleagues uh, from, the, from the government of Mexico have traveled even more <laughs> to Washington. I mean, we're, we're talking about almost weekly meetings, an ops tempo of, of collaboration uh, that I think has been tremendous uh, and, and really helped us uh, build out and enhance and institutionalize a lot of our ongoing uh, partnership in, in very meaningful ways. Um, in, in March or April, uh, forget the exact date, uh, many of you might have noticed, and I believe the, the Deputy Chief of Mission noted it today in his remarks, uh, I was very proud to sign uh, three key agreements uh, that are really focused on enhancing uh, our collaboration, on facilitating that economic trade across our border, on securing it and protecting both of our economies, our manufacturers and their intellectual property, and then extending our collaboration beyond our traditional customs to customs partnership, uh, to connect with uh, the Mexican agriculture authorities in Senesica uh, to really enhance that border crossing process and, and recognize that the more we can, the more friction we can take out of that, uh, the more effective it is uh, for cross-border trade. Uh, so the, the first, and we, we talked about it last year, uh, is, is unified cargo processing. Uh, last year we were piloting it. Uh, it started in Nogales, Arizona. Uh, under the leadership of Will Brooks, and, and I do need to acknowledge, many of you know Will uh, or knew him. He was a kind of a hero in Mexico City. I'd go down there and they'd say, well, it's nice that you're here, Commissioner, but we'd really like to see Will uh, because he's the guy doing the innovation. And, and I, I'm, I'm proud to say that his innovation and his insights uh, are, are going to last uh, in terms of the changes on our border. And he passed away uh, this, this year uh, to cancer. Uh, worked almost right up to the end uh, of his life, uh, but he leaves an incredible legacy of partnership. Uh, and we're inspired uh, to continue to allow our people in the field to innovate. Our port directors talking to each other each day to, to think of new ways to do things. And we're going to capitalize on that spirit and that energy uh, in memory of Will and, and continue the progress. Uh, but right now, every day, uh, his, his brainchild and his work uh, changes how we operate at, at nine ports of entry on the southwest border. Uh, we're we're co-located uh, with our partners from SAT, we're inspecting cargo together, and we're ensuring that trucks only need to stop once. Uh, this is mitigating the need for separate inspections, uh, so it's reducing that, that kind of two-stop or three-stop if you add the agriculture piece of the process. Uh, it's lowering wait times and in, enhancing certainty on the timing, which is so critical if you're moving perishables like produce, which is such a huge 
uh, cross-border uh, partnership for us. Uh, and we're also getting 99% compliance in this program uh, working together. Uh, so I, I think that's a tremendous uh, benefit for the industry. Uh, the MOU, what it does is, is it formalizes this type of agreement, whether we're going north or south, whether we're in the truck mode, if we're in the air environment, uh, we can work together to partner and facilitate that, that uh, cargo by, by doing that inspection together, sharing our information and making better decisions jointly. Uh, so we're excited to have that agreement and, and like to recognize uh, Jose uh, Martin Garcia's work in, in getting that to the, to over the finish line. Uh, the second uh, was a memorandum of cooperation on uh, facilitating the enforcement of our trade laws related to uh, you know, anti-competitive behavior in the supply chain, invasion of our respective uh, trade laws. Uh, this is the first time we've signed an agreement like this with SOT, uh, and, and we added, of course, our, our integral partner on the U.S. side, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations, which takes these uh, forward uh, for, for full uh, uh, consequences when people are avoiding our, our trade laws. Uh, and this agreement allows uh, CBP, ICE, and SOT to share information, best practices and expertise on illegal transshipment, uh, falsification of origin, uh, even though uh, we're obviously paused right now on NAFTA, that, that origin piece is going to be so critical once we get uh, that agreement moving forward. Uh, evasion of anti-dumping and countervailing duties, uh, and of course, uh, valuation issues uh, on both sides. So. It covers intellectual property rights uh, and consumer safety laws as well, and I think is an important statement that we're going to do this work together uh, and important protections for manufacturers uh, in both countries. Uh, and the third I mentioned briefly was this, this letter of intent we signed with Seneseca. Uh, re really, it, it's, it, agriculture protection is, is a really critical part of our mission. We have about 2,500 uh, people doing this work, and, and of course, uh, Mexico is our number one agriculture trading partner. Uh, so it was only natural uh, to, to partner with Mexico's National Health Service, Safety, and Agri-Food uh, Agency. Uh, it's, it's funny how si similar our, the philosophies are on, on terms of this protection, and we just saw a number of opportunities uh, to enhance that information sharing and work together more effectively, and then bring it to that inspectional process uh, at the border uh, to facilitate that further. Uh, we, we've got a lot more to do. Um, CBP is unique, I think, in the breadth of our partnerships uh, with the interagency in Mexico. Uh, I mentioned SOT heavily because we're talking about competitive border, uh, but of course with SEGO, with multiple agencies at, at SEGO, with Inmigración, with CISEN, uh, and of course uh, Sedena and Semar on the security front. So we, we partner with so many elements of the interagency. Uh, it, we've got a lot of shared priorities and shared principles. We've been working through them operationally, and, and we're hoping to continue to institutionalize them uh, and really just show that the benefits of this collaboration are, are so important uh, that they should continue uh, beyond a transition of, of administrations, uh, regardless of how the, the close-in-time election that we're all watching very closely. I was hoping to get some insights, but I wasn't at lunch long enough to hear uh, from uh, the ambassador or, or, or Duncan the prediction. Um, but it, it's, it's critical that we maintain the partnerships uh, going forward, and, and that's why I think institutionalizing these agreements and showing the benefits uh, are, are going to be critical as we move into the next uh, administration. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about an area that's been a huge challenge uh, in the U.S. the last several years. I, I, th I don't think you can open a newspaper uh, in the U.S. or watch a, a news show without hearing about the devastating impact of the opioid epidemic, uh, skyrocketing overdoses, synthetics uh, that, are, that are causing even more overdoses due to their potency. Uh, and then, of course, west of the Mississippi, uh, it might not be as prevalent in the media, but there's a methamphetamine epidemic uh, that that's, is devastating to communities uh, in, in the west. Uh, most of those hard narcotics are coming through our ports of entry, our land border ports of entry. Uh, especially in the West Coast uh, and Arizona and South Texas. Uh, the, the, the profits from these sales uh, are feeding this cycle, which all of you know well, the transnational criminal organizations that are, that are so violent and threatening uh, our neighbors and the Mexican citizens and populace. Uh, so we, we need to continue to do more in this area. Uh, at, at the border, our drug seizures, which are skyrocketing, meth and heroin are, are up dramatically again this year. Heroin's been going up. Uh, each year for seven years, uh, and now we're seeing this, this very small uh, types of shipments of, of fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent than heroin, so it can be concealed even more effectively. Uh, we, 
we know that this is coming in personally owned vehicles and coming in trucks uh, across our border. Uh, we get seizures from four sources, uh, intelligence and targeting. We use automated data very effectively. We partner with investigative agencies. Uh, that's an important source. Uh, we, we are canines. Uh, we have 1,500 canines. Uh, we use them very effectively at the border. They've all been trained now to detect synthetic opioids. Uh, we use uh, our officer uh, interviews and intuition on what they observe. Uh, but really, the, the most critical source and consistent source is non-intrusive inspection technology. Uh, but right now, we cannot put all those vehicles through an x-ray scan because we would slow, to, slow down the border. We'd break that, that vital trade uh, element. Uh, so what I'm really excited about is the developments in non-intrusive inspection technology, uh, which are safe for travelers to remain in their vehicle, but can effectively scan the vehicle to detect narcotics. So we've got multiple pilots uh, that we're going to be exploring this year uh, that I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, at Mariposa, uh, that gateway for agriculture into the U.S. in Nogales, Arizona, uh, we're working with the State Department, with the government of Mexico, uh, to get to a point where we can take that 18 percent or so of trucks uh, and scan 100 percent of them crossing that border and facilitate that travel. They won't need to stop for a second x-ray inspection on the U.S. side, even if we have a concern. Uh, that, that is a, an exciting and, and tremendous uh, development from my perspective. Uh, we're also going to be piloting this new technology as well as traffic flow procedures to enhance it, uh, really trying to get to a place where a trusted truck, a trusted driver gets a scan and never really has to stop uh, as they cross the border. Uh, that, that's, that's our vision. That's, that's David Higgerson, uh, who's been doing customs work uh, as long as many in this room have been breathing, if not longer. Uh, and, and he's still innovating uh, in his career. Uh, so at Laredo, Brownsville, and Donna, we're going to be piloting this type of technology and new CONOPS removing it effectively uh, on the border. Uh, so I'm very excited about the potential for these efforts. Uh, and and it's, it's very clear uh, that without our collaborative work with the government of Mexico, we can't get better and we can't. Uh, enhance the security and competitiveness of that border. Um, I, I talked to Chris on the way in, and, and I understand that there wasn't a lot of discussion on, on the challenges presented by migration flows and human smuggling. Um, with this expert group, I, I feel that we must uh, talk about this topic, which is so present uh, in our political environment, so present in, in the media uh, narrative these days. Uh, so I, I want to switch gears and close before we do some Q&A by talking a little bit about uh, immigration and really speaking candidly with this expert audience uh, about what we're seeing at this heightened moment and about effective strategies to work through it. Uh, my view, uh, a secure and competitive border not only depends on our efforts uh, to facilitate lawful trade and travel, but they also depend on our shared efforts to address human smuggling and the migration flows. For the last three months, as many of you have seen, we've seen 50,000 people uh, crossing the border illegally or presenting at ports of entry without documents. Uh, that means since 2014, we've seen over 250,000 children, unaccompanied children, and 320,000 family units make this incredibly dangerous and costly crossing. Uh, over 85 percent of these families and children are from the Northern Triangle of Central America. And they've made a very harrowing journey. They're paying smugglers five to seven thousand dollars per person. Uh, they're subjected to violence, assault, extortion, terrible conditions in stash houses along the way. They're encouraged by promises of success, of being granted asylum when they get to the United States, being given a permiso, even though most won't qualify for legal status when they ultimately see an immigration judge and have their case heard. They arrive at our border and meet a legal framework for immigration enforcement that cannot process their claims in a timely fashion and releases them into a legal limbo with false promises of hope. Only 20% on average are being granted asylum at the end of the process. Many do not come to their hearings and end up hiding in the shadows. I believe this group understands well, but I need to say it with clarity. The failure to enforce our immigration laws combined with the failure of Congress to address the systemic weaknesses in those laws has devastating consequences. These loopholes incentivize and invite the most vulnerable people in our region into the hands of the most violent criminal organizations in the hemisphere. Hundreds of migrants die each year on both sides of the border, including women and children, victims of both criminals and the elements. These costs are too high. 
Central American communities here are spending their savings to pay for this smuggling cycle, sending upwards of $1.5 billion a year to ruthless transnational criminal organizations who fight over access to the border, killing hundreds of Mexican citizens each year. Mexico is facing the highest murder rates in recent memory and its history in some areas. Just look at the experiences of citizens in Tamaulipas and Nuevo León if you want to understand the cost. And just as this administration has acknowledged with clarity publicly that U.S. demand for illicit drugs has terrible consequences for Mexico, so does the maintenance of a system that incentivizes human smuggling and funds these same organizations with a new profit stream. Imagine if these funds were sent to invest in the Central American economies and support their families there. Over three times the current U.S. aid to those countries each year. Imagine if they were invested in immigrant communities here in the United States. And this flow makes the U.S. more vulnerable to the scourge of hard narcotics surging into the country. Every day in Rio Grande Valley, I was there twice in the last three weeks, we see families and kids sent across as decoys to pull Border Patrol agents in so they are caring for them while the narcotics go around behind them. Th this status quo is not acceptable. For Central America, which is losing its energy and youth, for Mexico, which is victimized by the consequences of the smuggling, and for the United States. But, but we can solve these problems, and there's an important debate happening next week, we hope, in our Congress. We need to work with Congress in the administration to address the systemic vulnerabilities in our immigration system. These are not covered. The individual stories, which are incredibly sympathetic and painful, are covered, but not the systemic vulnerabilities. A better system would allow us to keep families together during their swift and fair immigration proceedings. A better system would keep vulnerable people from putting themselves in the hands of ruthless smugglers. The left and right have agreed that our system is broken for three administrations. They've said it publicly repeatedly. Let's fix it. We need to partner with Mexico fundamentally to align our approaches to managing these flows of migrants, to attack the TCOs that prey on the most vulnerable, and to drive regional efforts to enhance our approaches to migration challenges from Canada to Brazil. Mexico has been a leader in this. Uh, former Commissioner Adelio Vargas of Inmigracion, Commissioner Garcia, they see the dynamic starting in Brazil, being critically enhanced in, in Colombia and Panama, and then arriving in our region. We need to work together throughout the region to address it. And we must partner on a sustained and effective effort to support enhanced security and governance, to be sure, but also, most critically, effective programs to promote economic prosperity in Central America. Development of the economies of the Northern Triangle is essential to the region and to our shared borders. So with this expert group that has so much influence uh, on policymaking, so much influence on our diplomatic dialogues, I, I, I offer that we need to tackle these challenges together. Uh, the, the costs and the consequences are, are too high, and we're seeing them every day. So I want to thank, and sorry on the uh, the somber note, but it's, it's an important conversation that we need to have. I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for having me, the Border Trade Alliance, uh, for, for this lunch, uh, and I look forward to continue our collaboration uh, and dialogue on these critical issues to our border. Thank you. Okay. Who has some questions? Um, Identify yourself and then ask your question. Sam, over there. We have microphones around, which we'll bring to you. Sam Bale, uh, Border Trade Alliance Policy you, Committee. Uh, we're really struggling with how we get the funding to CBP for all the modern technology that would be used, we think, as legitimately southbound as northbound because there's two ways to stop the bad guys, and we have to take advantage of both of them. And we've got a lot of public-private partnerships going on, but if you go to a city and they're putting in $70 million on a donation, well, it's kind of hard to spend several million dollars on the latest and greatest X-ray machine for southbound, but you need that. Is there any possibility that there would be some ability to do some con concessions and allow them to get their, the, the funds to repay 
the machine and then give it, you obviously be run by, by CBP, but it's just, we're gonna have to find some more creative ways of getting funds into CBP to do the things that we want. Uh, we're right now asking for more ag specialists and we're asking for them to be GS-12s <laughs> because those guys pay off because they know how to release and they have the experience. So these are the ways we're trying to work with CBP to augment what you've got. Th thanks so much, Sam, for your comments and your question and, and your partnership. Uh, you know, the, the efforts in, in South Texas in particular, uh, with Senator Cornyn's help and others, to have flexible ways to work with industry and state and local stakeholders where there's a return on investment to invest in technology or officer hours, I think have been tremendously successful and we'll continue those. Uh, I think I'd just point to the, the fiscal year 18 budget, which we, we got fairly recently, made a historic uh, new investment in non-intrusive inspection technology. Uh, that message on, on the capability of this technology and the need for it uh, to secure flows north and south, I think has been received. Uh, and this partnership at Monte Posa, where we're gonna be working with, with Department of State, uh, with state funding, Government of Mexico, DHS Science and Technology, I think will really help us show the value of that north and southbound uh, perspective on, on the inspection. So I uh, could not agree with you more. Uh, I do think Congress is aware. I, I had our, our new chairman of our probes committee uh, down in the southern border. It's been a bipartisan issue of support. Uh, almost every state in the country is worried about, about drugs crossing that border and about the consequences of money and weapons flowing south. So I, I appreciate the question very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner. I remember uh, last year we were having this uh, conference and we were bemoaning the fact that Will was going to retire and what a resource. And now we, we continue to be a great legacy, great man. Um, we'll be celebrating him at the Area Commission uh, later this week. It's a special honor for, for Will. The uh, city of San Luis is over there actually just uh, uh, changed the ordinances and uh, Named a street after him before he passed. So I'm going to have Thank to you. wait. I'm going to probably that. have to wait until after I pass, and then a long time after that. But um, uh, it, so Chris Wilson and his uh, article on the myths in the in the Washington Post has had to do with um, the this what it, what constitute how do we define a secure border. And many different factions on both the left and right can wrap themselves around border security, but until we define it, how do we address it? Until, if you don't know what is, how it's defined, how do we create a metric for a success? Is it time for the Alliance and other organizations like the Woodrow Wilson Institute on Mexico to start begging the question continuously from Congress, define what you mean by border security, let's come to consensus, and then we can fix it. I think, I think that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of work that's been done uh, in the last several years, both within CBP, but in the academic community, uh, at the DHS uh, Office of Immigration Statistics, which has been looking at these challenges uh, directly. Um, I, I think the, the key thing, though, for this administration is the, the foundation from uh, the January uh, 25th, 2017 executive order, which establishes the goal of, of not allowing any illegal crossings between ports of entry. It's an operational control. It's a very high standard, uh, but it's a standard that the Border Patrol has been able to articulate its requirements against. Uh, you know, starting with the priority areas. Everything is prioritized, and right now that priority uh, is primarily in, in South Texas and Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so, so that's part of it between the ports. Uh, but at the ports, we, we talk about a well-managed border where we're addressing risk effectively uh, while facilitating that trade and travel. There, there always has to be uh, that dual effort. Uh, I think we'd welcome a greater dialogue on what that means. I, I think everybody's clear that we're not stopping enough of the drugs coming in through our ports of entry as we need to. Uh, we're seeing that in, the, in efforts in the mail and express consignment environment uh, to pass the legislation and, and expectations on U.S. Postal Service and foreign partners to provide us more data so we can do that more effectively. Uh, but, but I do think that's a worthwhile dialogue. Uh, and, and I do think industry has a voice in that dialogue on, on the expectations and, and understanding the billions and billions of dollars of economic flow that cross in the same areas. And just a quick follow-up to that, should we be looking at uh, unified decision-making process? 
So that, that's a very interesting question. I, I think there are some concepts. Which is our uni unified vehicle uh, process inspection also. Yeah, it, it, there, there's some concepts of operation that we're, we've d discussed with the government of Mexico and, and looking forward, we want to be on the same page with our infrastructure priorities. Uh, are, are there opportunities to, to build uh, ports of entry infrastructure on both sides of the border in a, in a partnership way so that we can do much more of that unified look at vehicles? I, I think that's all uh, potential. I mean, uh, w a few years ago, the, the notion of private sector investment in a border crossing was just a, just an idea. Uh, Alan Burson provided an existence proof in the Cross Border Express, and, and we're benefiting from that. I think you know that the next stage would be even more shared uh, oversight at, at the actual line. Great, Bernardo. What come on? Is there somebody over here? <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner Bernardo Yellow of the Union Pacific Railroad. And I would like to build a little bit on the uh, security aspect of things. Uh, when you Today we had a very robust conversation around trade and what NAFTA means to trade. And when you look back when NAFTA was enacted, uh, you know, part of the uh, engagement that Mexico had was to improve its logistics. Now with security into your uh, building on your comments about this organized crime, uh, now what they're doing is now spilling over into what's happening in the logistics side within Mexico. Um, Back then, when NAFTA was enacted, there were some provisions to uh, incent or promote an improvement in logistics. Do you see that NAFTA could become an instrument where some security components would be inserted to promote and work closer together with Mexico partners to improve security uh, down south? So, uh, yes, I, I, I appreciate that, that question, and it's very consistent with our, our philosophy of securing supply chains uh, from start to finish, whether it's, it's CTPAT's efforts and, and the modernization of CTPAT. Um, I'm going to forget what the new name for, for NEC is in Mexico. A AEO, simple. It's the global name. So you went, you went with an easy acronym, Authorized Economic Operator. I, I, I was asked this question actually at an event in Mexico City, is how can uh, industries, especially logistics providers, kind of be part of that, that program and see that, that their uh, efforts are included. Uh, one area we're working on that right now is with e-commerce marketplaces. Uh, so much of that small package trade is going into warehouses where it's all looked at individually uh, by a major uh, company. Why can't we work with them on a new trusted program? I I'm open to that. would welcome that conversation. Thank you. Jose Diaz with Reforma from Mexico. On immigration, uh, can you speak about the relevance of reaching a safe third country agreement with Mexico and how close are you on the talks? So definitely can't comment on in specific diplomatic efforts, but I, but I can talk about the concept of aligning migration policies and the impact uh, that that has. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to visit a refugee camp uh, in Turkey uh, uh, filled with refugees from Syria and, and elsewhere. Uh, I've been to the, the Norway border with Russia uh, to see what, what happened when a, a migration flow uh, came out of nowhere, essentially, 400 miles in, uh, north of the Arctic Circle uh, between Murmansk and, and Norway. And it was people from 38 countries, 5,500 in the winter and fall uh, coming across the border. But why, why was that happening? Uh, and and it, was, it was happening because there was not alignment between the destination country and the transit countries and not enough investment and protection in the origin countries. So I do believe, and, and many countries do, Canada uh, has a safe third agreement with us, that aligning on migration policies and then jointly investing in, in uh, improving economic and security conditions in sending countries is a, is a good strategy when we're facing a world where there's unprecedented flows of migration. The vulnerable populations around the world are on the move. If we're not working on this together with partners, uh, with, with like-minded democracies and, and G20 economies, uh, then, then we're missing an opportunity uh, to, to address this and to protect people. So I, I do think it's, it's beneficial to align policies more broadly, and we've seen that work effectively between Germany and Turkey, uh, between Norway and Russia, uh, Australia and Indonesia. It, we should really look at it. Thank you. Please, so right here. Commissioner McAleen, and thanks for your comments. And um, I'm, I'm Lance Jungmeyer with the Fresh Produce Association of America. We're in Nogales, Arizona, so we're lots of agriculture today. So. Lots of agriculture, yeah. and we're we're uh, you know we, we support your effort to uh, interdict all the hard narcotics, and and 100% uh, scans is definitely one of the best ways to to, to do that. Um, so I have a comment and a question. Um, my my comment would be that as you move forward with this, please 
please uh, develop a, a stakeholder advisory group that can give you some real-time feedback about <clears throat> how this is actually going, because we're, if you're talking about going from 18% to 100% scans, uh, that's, that's obviously a very, very big difference. Uh, and of course, we, we don't want to see trade move backwards. My, my question for you would be, um, with this sort of technology, we, we know that Nogales Mariposa already is, is extremely understaffed, but do you see this changing your thinking, the equation about how staffing occurs, or do you think there's still more staffing that will be needed at, at a port like Mariposa? Well, good question. And first of all, our, uh, hiring, sustaining a world-class law enforcement workforce is my, my top priority as, as commissioner. We are making progress on CBP officer hiring and expect to meet our targets in, in the bill, which is an, another 325 officers this year, uh, which is, that would take us well over 1,200 in the last four years. So we're, we're making progress on our officer hiring in, in Nogales as a critical location for, for having more. Uh, technology is helping us with our processing. It's the only way we're keeping up with the, the travelers in the air environment, uh, our APC kiosks, our mobile processing. Uh, on, on smartphones and, and soon to be facial recognition is, is really a game changer for us on how we can facilitate travel. That means our officers can do their law enforcement work, what they're trained to do. Um, we, we see technology aiding that as well on the land border, but, but I think you're absolutely right to, to call for a stakeholder advisory group so we can look at all of the impacts of change flows and con ops, which might include a lot more targets to, to inspect at, at the outset until we have algorithms tuned for automated image analysis, uh, until we have our officers trained and ready to see more things and more different types of, of cargo. So uh, ultimately, I do think it will help alleviate staffing concerns and keep up with flow and facilitate that trade, but it's gonna be uh, something we've worked through in the pilots and we'll definitely appreciate your advice. Chris? Thanks very much. I, we heard uh, from Jose Martin Garcia and, and some other panelists from the private sector about the NAFTA negotiations uh, this morning, but I, I wondered if you could give us a CBP perspective, not on the entirety of the negotiations, but I, I know you guys are very focused on the, the trade facilitation side of things, the customs side of things, you know, how it is that the United States is seeing progress made in those areas in the negotiations, what, what you're hoping to really have accomplished by the time we have a, an updated NAFTA. Sure. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to have a joint perspective and a, a shared view of how we can in trade, do trade enforcement together. Uh, I, I think the idea of having a cooperative economic community is so that others can't exploit it by pretending they're from one or the other country. So I, I think the work that's been done with our partners from SOT, with our partners from uh, CBSA at, at the table, uh, with, with the broader negotiation will enhance that and, and clarity on on the rules of origin and how we'll interpret it, I, I think we'll just streamline uh, those efforts. Uh, you know, we, we have that implementation, not the trade policy setting role, I'll just mention that. Uh, but the implementation piece is, is critical and, and we've had, I think, more involvement than ever in a trade negotiation uh, on the NAFTA modernization in, ter in terms of how the policies will be uh, implemented and how, how we'll be impacted at the border. So I think that's been a real positive of the dialogue. Duncan? Last one. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I wanted to um, pick up on your, your comments about fentanyl, et cetera. There's been a lot of uh, reporting in the media and the press in particular about the use of the U.S. Postal Service to bring in these substances directly into the United States without going through Mexico and the traditional uh, ports of entry or, or you know, along the border. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on, on how that's really transforming the, the drug business and what impact you're seeing on how organized crime groups are operating. Sure. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so uh, on fentanyl and, and synthetic opioids uh, in, in the U.S. Postal and, and mail, a couple challenges. Uh, one, it can, it's a lot more pure than drugs coming across the land borders, about 90% purity. You could get a vial of 25 grams and effectively in a pill press operation in the U.S. make a tremendous amount of doses and, and, and generate a huge profit. Uh, the mail environment is governed by a treaty, Universal Postal Union Treaty, which impacts the ability uh, to mandate data and changes that we can do in other cargo environments. Uh, so we work closely with the U.S. Postal Service, and I want to just quickly highlight the progress. A, a year ago, well less than 10 percent of the data on parcels was available for us to assess at the border. Uh, we're now well over 50 percent and growing because China is participating. Uh, they're sending information in. Uh, that means at JFK, we already have doubled our fentanyl seizures from last year, uh, and the vast majority of those are targeted based on the data. Uh, so that's putting us in a lot better posture. 
Uh, so it, but we don't want uh, new channels, uh, new avenues uh, to the U.S. Uh, for the TCOs to exploit, and, and really even mom and pop pill presses ordering off the dark web directly. Uh, that's much harder for, for law enforcement uh, to address. And just, just to close with the, because th these stats have resonated even with our e-commerce partners when we, when we highlight it, we're over four times as much uh, mail parcels uh, every day as four years ago. Uh, that last year at this time, we had 1.2 million parcels a day. Now it's 1.7 in 12 months. Um, and, and these are the same international mail facilities, the same U.S. Postal System, the same CBP uh, staffing and, and, and personnel, although we've got some new technology. So it's a huge challenge. It's one we need to continue to tackle uh, together with U.S. Postal, and, and I think Congress is pretty focused on uh, giving us the authorities and the push uh, to do it better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks for all that you and your team are doing in really tough situation. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank, all the best. All right.